far and wide. I have spent all power of sea and sky against those Trojans. What good had the Seraphs been to me, or Scylla, or, or gaping Charybdis? In other words, I laid all these traps and they somehow made it through. The Trojans have settled down secure in the Tiber Channel. They so craved, safe from the waves and me. And then she starts to mention other gods like Mars and others who get away with jacking humans. Why can't I? She says, I endured it all at 360. Nothing left undared. I stoop to any attack. Still, he, Aeneas, defeats me, Aeneas. But if my forces are not enough, I'm hardly the one to relent. I'll plead for the help I need, wherever it may be. And then a famous line, if I cannot sway the heavens, I'll wake the powers of hell. In other words, if gods won't help me, I'll do it on my own, and I'll and I'll use hell to do it. It's not for me to deny him his Latin, is it's not for me to deny him his Latin throne. So be it. Let Lavinia be his bride, an iron fact of fate. But I can drag things out, delay the whole affair. That I can do, and destroy the root and branch, the people of either king. What a price they'll pay! Line three seventy for the father and son-in-law's alliance here. Yes, Latin and Trojan blood will be your dowry, princess. Bologna, goddess of war, your maid of honor. So Hecuba's not the only one who spawned a firebrand, who brought to birth a wedding torch of a son. Venus's son will be the same. And then she says of, of Aeneas, a Paris reborn, a funeral torch to consume, a second Troy. She then, and she goes and gets this fury, Electro. Uh, Electo is, is the, the mother of sorrows, She's just brutal. Uh, even Pluto, her father, doesn't want to have anything to do with her. He hates her. Her hair, black snakes. She is going to create all kinds of havoc. Juno goes to her at lines 390 and says, Hey, I need you to help me out here. By the way, this thing about having snakes in the hair and the way she uses these snakes... I mean, think about all of the different snake references in the Aeneid, right? You'll remember the coiled snake of Anchises uh, at, his, at, his, um, at his tomb. And when we get to Milton in Paradise Lost, we're going to have a very famous snake there as well, okay, that we'll get to later. Um, and she says it to Electo, you have a thousand names and a thousand deadly arts. Shake them out of your teeming heart, sunder their pack of peace, sow crops of murderous war. Now in a stroke, make young men thirst for weapons, demand them, grasp them now. And again, when we take a look at Remarks, really important novel, All Quiet on the Western Front, a text we will deal with later in AP. Um, we're we're, we're going to see something very similar, how young men are just thoroughly convinced, like, of course, in Stephen Crane's Red Badge of Courage, Henry is so excited to go and fight in the wars until, of course, he's not. Then um, we're told that Electo, the first place she goes is to Amata, the queen, and Electo flings a snake from her black hair at the queen and thrusts it down her breast, the very depths of her heart, and the horror drives her mad to bring the whole house down. The snake glides between her robes and her smooth breasts, but she feels nothing, no shudder of coils, senses nothing at all as the viper breathes its fire through the frenzied queen. Line 410. The enormous snake becomes the gold choker around her throat, the raveling end of a headband bradling through her hair, writhing over her body. I mean, this is brilliant poetry. In other words, when Amata gets so worked up, it isn't, it isn't Amata's fault. It's because Electo, through Juno's instruction, has done it. The fever hits. Amata is so upset at line 420, she says to her husband, So, Lavinia goes in wedlock to these Trojans, exiles? You, her father, have you no pity for your daughter? None for yourself? No pity for me, your mother, her mother? Wait, with the first north wind, that lying pirate will desert us, setting sail on the high seas, our virgin is his loot. In other words, he's going to sail away. We think, of course, of what he did with Dido, and <laughs> we have to smile. She says it. Isn't that exactly what happened to Helen as well, who got, you know, who got taken off to Troy? She says, and what about Turnus? We owe him, in other words. Um, and very similar to the way that Aeneas responded to Dido, we're told that Latinus just, uh, he's, he's, um, uh, the desperate appeals are of no use. He's got no interest in it at all. We're told that the unlucky queen, the language is exactly the language of, that was used about Dido in, in Aeneid 4, at line 440. The unlucky queen then goes nuts, and then amazing word pictures uh, simulate, spinning like a top that little boys play with, where she's just spinning, spinning, spinning. Through the city she goes, all kinds of upset, she's in Bacchus's grip, and rumor flies, all of the women go crazy, they're all mad, um, out into the woods they all go, and Amada even will take Lavinia with her to try and hide her. Secondly, we will have then Electo going to Turnus, and we're going to see him for the first time. He's sleeping. She will transform herself into an old nurse, an old lady, um, Kalebi, and, uh, and, and she will speak to him and say, the king denies you your wife, 
you're a laughing stock, you need to go to war and jack um, um, uh, Latinus as well as these Trojans. We're told that Turnus in 510, he wakes up and he mocks the old woman. So a fleet sailed into the Tiber, the tale's not failed as you imagine. To reach my ears, stop concocting this panic for me, please. Queen Juno has hardly wiped me from her mind. It's your dotage, mother, you, your dotering wreck, too spent to see the truth that shakes you with anguish. All for nothing now, he says. You and your warring kings, your false alarms, you mockery of a prophet. And then he says it. Waddle off. Men make war and peace. Wars there were. And then Electo, she will ignite in rage, and the many serpents all of a sudden will come hissing at <laughs> Turnus, rolling her eyes and fiery. She says, So, I'm in my dotage, am I? A dotering wreck, too spent to see the truth. I and my warring kings, a mockery of a prophet, am I? False alarms? Well, look at these alarms. I come to you from the nightmare furies, Dan. I brandish war and death in my right hand. And we're told that she then puts a torch into his chest, and immediately he shouts for armor, frenzy. He's ready. He burns with lust for the sword, the cursed madness of war, and rage to top it off. He roars like a blur, like a blazing brush piled under the ribs cauldron. It's an amazing simile. And he calls his captains together, and they're all ready to go to war. Electo has done her job for Juno. The third place Electo goes is to Elias, the son of, 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 uh, of Aeneas. And she invites him <clears throat> and the hounds he's hunting with to kill a favorite stag. It is Sylvius' favorite stag. It is tame. And in the process of doing this, this will be the cause of the war. In other words, a silly, silly event causes a major conflict. Elias himself, we're told in 580, fired with a love of glory. We know this about him earlier. Aims his shaft from his tense bow. Electo steadies his trembling hand. The arrow shot with a whirling rush. Pierces through womb and loins. And the young and the, and the wounded stag goes back to die. And then um, Terrorus will immediately be ready to go to war at line 590. He rallies his troops. He's just been splitting an oak and four with wedges. Now breathing fury. He seizes a woodman's axe. It will be ironic because Alma, the first one to die a few lines later, will be the same Terrorus son. Finally, number four, Alecto will give all of the herdsmen, the, uh, the, the people who work out in the fields, gets them all worked up. An amazing line, anxious mothers clutch their babies to their breasts because Trojans are reeling ready for war. The battle lines form up, six, um, um, 608. The battle lines form up, no rustic, no rustic free-for-all with clubs and charged stakes. They'll fight to the finish now with two-edged swords. A black harvest of naked steel bristles far and wide. It's a brilliant word picture. Instead of harvesting grain, they're going to be harvesting lives with the steel. Um, and, and then another uh, epic simile, amazing simile at, at 613. Like a billow whitening under the wind's first gust as crest on crest the ocean rises. These, in other words, it's, uh, the, the, the build up to war is like the rising of a tsunami. Here. All, already we're ready to begin the fight. A youngster breaks from the front and an arrow whizzes in and, he, and down he goes. Almo, the eldest son of Tyrus, the very one who wanted this fight to start. The point lodges deep in his throat and chokes off the moist path for his voice and his faint life breath uh, with blood. Uh, two things. This is going to sound a lot like Iliad language and we're going to have a lot of this. So just get yourself ready for what's coming. We're going to have a lot of different ways that metal can kill a man through the uh, course of, of the poem. Around him, Al Almo, heaps of dead, and among them, old Galatius, killed as he sat himself in their midst to beg for peace, the irony of all ironies. Galatius, the old man, we're told, the most righteous man in all the Italian fields long ago, the richest too, we're told, he tries to tell them not to do this to no good. Fury's power has lived up to her promise. She's fleshed the war in blood, inaugurated in 630 the slaughter with a kill, and now she leaves Hesperia. She goes to Juno. She says, look, I've done your bidding, perfected a work of strife with ghastly war. By the way, so much for, um, for Zeus saying at the beginning of the Odyssey that the gods are not to blame for all the pain and suffering that humans enjoy. They bring it on themselves. Well, I don't know. This, this poem obviously seeming to suggest, no, no, Cajuno definitely is helping this one out. Um, uh, Electo will finish by saying, you know, I can even do better. I'm going to get all of these surrounding towns maddened for lust of battle. They'll rush to the rescue now at line 640 from every side. I'll sow their fields with swords. Dark, ironic line. 
Juno will say, enough terror. <laughs> I'm going to take care of everything. I'll manage everything from here on out. Don't worry about it. Electo, we're told, will return to hell. Down she goes to her place there where she will um, um, abide. We're told that the herdsmen will bring uh, their, um, uh, their dead back along with Almo and Glaucus, right? And, of course, we've got uh, Turnus at 670 ready to go. Trojans are called to share our realm. Hydrogen blood, he says, will corrupt our own, and I'm driven from the doors, he says, and all whose mothers maddened by Bacchus dance in frenzy through trackless woods. Amata's name has no light weight, swarm in from all sides, wearying Mars with war's cries. Suddenly, we're told, all are demanding this accursed war against all omens, against the divine power of fate. They are spurned by a wicked impulse. They rush to ring the palace of King Latinus round, but he stands fast, like a rock at a sea. A sea-bound rock that won't give way when a big surge hits and the howling breakers pound it hard. Its bulk stands fast through its foaming reefs and spurs roar on. All for nothing, a seaweed dashing against its flanks swirls away in the backwash. We're going to see that Latinus is a symbol of a, of a leader who doesn't want to go to war, but he's going to be pushed there. Finally, he will say it out loud. I'm crushed by fate, he says, at line 690 or so. My poor people, he says... Uh, you're wrenched away by the tempest, my poor people. You will pay for your outrage with your blood. You, Turnus, the guilt is yours, and a dreadful end awaits you. And of course, the very last lines of the Aeneid will be Turnus's death. You will implore the gods with prayers that come too late. He says, myself, now I've reached my peaceful haven here at the harbor's mouth. I'm robbed of a happy death. In other words, the, the, the thing that all leaders would wish that would never happen is happening to him. No more. He said no more. And then we're told he sealed himself in his house and dropped the reins of power. Now this abdication of power is a sign that maybe Latinus is not the best of leaders and he is an old man after all. But we're told he backs away. We're then told about the old custom and this is not done a lot in the Aeneid. But Virgil will say um, at, at, uh, at line, um, right before line 700, there was a custom in Latium, land of the West, and ever after revered in Alban towns, and now great Rome that rules the world reveres it too, that when it was time to go to war, you push these um, twin gates of war open. And uh, Latinus won't do it. He refuses, in fact, to do it. When he's pressed to do it, he locks himself from sight. And so Juno will do it. She opens the gates and then we're told at line 275 all Italy blazed until that instant all unstirred in her now some gear up to cross the plains on foot some riding high on their horses wildly churn the dust and shout out to arms polishing shields smooth brandishing lances bright with rich thick grease honing their axes keen on grindstones and then at line 370 or 730 and this will be why? There are so many writers who will look at this passage as, as this book as propaganda, and the entire poem, of course, is propaganda. Oh, what joy to advance the banners, hear the trumpets blare. This, of course, will be counterbalanced, as I've said already, by reading texts like All Quiet on the Western Front, like um, Red Badge of Courage, or Vonnegut's classic Slaughterhouse Five. All of those, of course, require readings for us in AP to give us some sense of the balance and how and how we respond to this. Um, our, the poetry of any number of, of war poets like Sasson and others. Um, Randall Jarrell, The Death of the Baltery Gunner, comes to mind. Right. We're told at line 740 they beat their plows into weapons. It's given way to this, all their pride in the sight and the harrow, all their love to the plow. They reforge in the furnace all their father's swords. Now the triumphs blare, the trumpets blare, the watchwords out for war. One warrior wildly tears a helmet from his house. One yokes his panting, steaming team to a chariot, donning his shield and mail, triple meshed in gold, and he straps a trusty sword round his waist. And then we get another invocation to the muse. Virgil's into his game here, and he's writing for a Roman people that love stories of war and violence. Now throw Halcyon open, muses, he says. Launch your song. What kings were fired for war? What armies at their orders thronged the plains? What heroes sprang into bloom? What weapons blazed even in those days long ago, line 750, in Italy's life-giving land? You are goddesses, that you remember it all, and you can tell it all. All we catch is the distant ring of fame. Then 
we will have the list of the warriors. We don't have time to go through all this. I wish we did. But very much like that catalog of ships in Iliad 2, we have the same game being played here, where we're going to hear all kinds of different warriors. They're amazing warriors, and they're all really scary. We have Mezentius and his uh, son Leuses. We have um, Aventius and the famous shield of his that's described. He comes out in the lion's hide. We have twin brothers who show up ready to go and fight. We have Mispas. We have... Um, that they're all marching and singing in cadence as the birds are singing as well. We have Clausius, all of this of course designed to show us just how much Aeneas is going to have serious armies against him. We even have a mention of Halcius's, um, Halcius is uh, Agamemnon's man who hated the very name of Troy coming with his team of, uh, of uh, his chariots as well. Some of these guys bringing thousands and thousands of soldiers with them. Finally, we'll have Umbro, the a medicine man that's going to come. We have Vibrus, the son of Hippolytus, who will come. And then finally, at line 9, 10 or so, we have Magnificent Turnus. Sword brandish, marches among his captains, topping all by a head. Triple plumed, his high helmet raises up a chimera with all the fires of Etna blasting from its throat. Um, he, we're told that his shield is, the, is uh, on the brazen shield. We have art on the shield. Io blazoned in gold. In the next book, we're going to get the shield of Aeneas. Of course, we're familiar in book 18 of, Ane of the Iliad with the shield of Aeneas, right? Um, we're told following Turnus comes a cloud of troops on foot, shield-bearing battalions swarming the whole plain, men in their prime. All from all different places, from all over Italy they show up. We're told that even at line 933, Camellia rides, sprung of the Volscian peoples, heading her horsemen, squadrons, gleaming bronze, this warrior girl with her young hands untrained from a nervous spools and baskets filled with wool, a virgin seasoned to bear the rough work of battle, swift to outrace the winds with her lightning pace. Camellia could, this is how fast she is, skim the tips of the unreaped, un unreaped crops never bruising the tender ears in their swift rush, or wing her way, hovering over the mid-sea swell, and never dip her racing feet in the waves. She could run across the top of the grain or across the water. Young men all came pouring from homes and fields, and crowding mothers marvel or to that, you know, that myth that the Spartan mothers would say to their sons, you know, return with your shield or on it. They stare at her as she strides awestruck, breathless. How the beauty of the royal purple cloaks her glossy shoulders how her golden brooch binds up her hair, how she cradles a Lysian quiver, her shepherd's staff of myrtle spiked with steel. And that's how the poem ends, the, the book ends. And of course the tragedy is all of them will soon die, right? The tragedy of, of war. Let's turn now to level two and three. At 2A, well, I, I mean, we said it to begin with. Conquering is, of course, usually supported by slaughter and by war. And of course, usually it's defined as the gods are giving us this right. We think, of course, of the many, many different ways in history that this game has been played and, of course, not lost on us as we study a text like this is the idea that when those early uh, Europeans arrived in North America, there were people already here, as we say in our American literature in our junior year lectures. You can go back and see those again in AP, or in, uh, on, uh, at learnstrong.net. Of course, when they arrived, they use the idea that God had given the land to these people and therefore redemptive violence, the slaughter of all those people. We think about a text like Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee as a, as a way to critique that idea. Also point out that they notice the youngest and the oldest are the first to die, right? And of course, they're going to have to be a whole lot more death. The final message, notice, from silly, silly little trivial kind of acts. I mean, like Elias, you know, shooting a, a, a stag, uh, Sylvia stag. We're going to have this huge war that erupt. And obviously at 3B we could ask, when is the last time in your memory that this kind of thing happened? The symbolism is self-evident. Latinus, of course, is going to be symbolic of the leader who can't control the fury of the people. Amata is going to be symbolic of, of course, a, a, a mad mom who is going to do anything she can to get things right for her daughter. Lavinia, of course, is the sad, tragic pawn in our story. Very much like um, Trisius at the beginning of the Iliad, nobody's asked her what she thinks at all. She doesn't have a voice. Of course, Turnus, he will be the villain of this text. His wounded pride will obviously lead him to this, but you can, you can appreciate why. I mean, he's been promised that he's going to be given this princess, and then all of a sudden, no, and it's going to be given to some complete and total stranger.
The irony, well, there's bunches of them, obviously, but think of it. Juno and Electo, they love to start this fighting. They're the gods, right? Why would they have such a, such a love, a passion for war? Notice the other irony is that so many innocent women and children and men will die to accomplish what? Well, this promise that's been given to Aeneas that this land is actually his. By the way, note the irony as well that how little Aeneas is actually in or appears in this book. You know, he's, he's virtually not here at all. At level 3A, comparing this to the Iliad, we've already mentioned book 2, the catalog of the ships, the Odyssey. Notice uh, in, in the Odyssey, Athena drives the slaughter in book 22. Here, of course, it's Juno and, uh, and Electum. What are the texts for you that celebrate war? You can jot those down, the video games that you play, and that kind of thing. I mean, I've had students that read this, and then they go, you know, it's funny, I guess I hadn't thought about that, the propagandizing that happens when I play Call of Duty and other kinds of, other kinds of games that celebrate war. What are the texts then for you that critique war, rather harshly sometimes? We've mentioned All Quiet on the Western Front. We've mentioned Red Badge of Courage. We've mentioned Slaughterhouse Five. There's others as well that we could mention. Finally, at 3B, well, what is your view of war as a resolution for conflict? Is it necessary? Is it sometimes inevitable? And what about the idea that war often gets started for some kind of silly or trivial reason and then it kind of just goes like a wave, we're told, right? Just cresting. What about this idea that it's the God's fault or it's the God's responsibility that warfare must happen? or the gods have given the right for certain kinds of slaughter that must happen. Of course, any time we're reading texts, we are going to pay attention to this kind of thing. The idea that a people have been promised a land and therefore they get the right to kill whoever is in the land because God said so. Obviously, our biblical uh, reading of, of uh, the book of Joshua 10 and 11 will give us the word exterminate actually is used there. And women and children are, in fact, slaughtered as the, as the land is given to these, uh, to these exiles who come out of Egypt. We're seeing a recapitulation of that. We'll see it over and over again in our study. What are your thoughts about that, the notion that if you can blame it on the gods, then it's okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's Juno's fault. It's Electo's fault. Well, now we are ready for the war in Book 8. But first, like Achilles' shield in Iliad 18, we're going to have the shield of Aeneas. And, of course, the 